This episode of Literary Treks is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry and you're listening to Trek FM. taking all these books? I thought I'd take some light reading, in case I got bored. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Literary Treks. This is episode number 255, Enemy Territory. That's the book that we're going to be reviewing on the feature of today's show. It's the third book in the IKS Gorkun series. I am just one of your hosts, Bruce Gibson, and with me in his hammock, I know you're probably going, what? A hammock? You'll know about that later if you listen to the feature. In his hammock is Dan Gunther. Dan, how are you doing? Not too bad, Bruce. Boy, I wish I could do this show from a hammock. That would be amazing. (laughs) Have you ever had a hammock? I haven't. I, I would love a hammock, though. I think I've never really thought of it before, but now I really want a hammock. (laughs) <laughs> you know what? Not only do I want a hammock, I want a hamburger. <laughs> a hammock and a hamburger sounds really good to me right now. <laughs> I would I would be okay with that combination as well for sure. <laughs> yes. Well, I love hamburgers. It's my it's my favorite food. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. So as I mentioned, we're going to do the IKS Gorkin book three in the feature. And Justin Ozer from Earl Grey is going to be joining us. He's been on the previous episodes of this book series discussing it with us. So it only makes sense that he's back again to talk to us about it. But before we get to that, we have two news items. One is Waypoint. Now, we just did an episode where we went through the Waypoint special number one in 2018. Well, we have an announcement that we have a Waypoint special coming in March for 2019. So this is our second Waypoint special. And uh, the blurb here says it's the anthology series celebrating 50 plus years of Star Trek continues in this new oversized special featuring four all new tales written and drawn by some of today's top creators. This new installment of the hit waypoint special will revisit fan favorite characters all across the star Trek universe. So when waypoint had premiered, there was two stories in each issue and then the series went away. Now we got it back as a special just a month or so ago. And now we're, getting another special. So Waypoint definitely is back. Yeah, I'm really excited for this. I actually wasn't really expecting another one. I thought that was just kind of a special one-off thing, but it looks like they're going to continue at least one more special issue with four stories in it. And I got to say, I've really become a fan of the Waypoint stories. I think the last special had some really great stories in it, really amazing artwork. And the kinds of stories that you wouldn't normally get in an ongoing series or something like that. These are unique points of view and stories done by creators and artists who aren't part of like the regular crop of artists and writers for Star Trek comics. So I love this different perspective and the fact that we're getting more makes me really excited. Yeah. I'm excited about this too. As we mentioned in the previous episode, when we reviewed the waypoint comic, it's like the comic version of short treks. It gives us mm-hmm. that opportunity to tell shorter stories involving our main characters or side characters or sometimes kind of story that doesn't fit into the regular narrative of a 
series. So yeah, it's really enjoyable. And uh, just to see different writing styles and different artistic styles is also fun too. So it's not just an exploration of story, but also of art. So I, I do quite enjoy those. So the other news story we have is a Star Trek Golden Book. We had mentioned in a previous episode about Golden Book's publishing Star Trek stories for kids. Well, now there's a third one that has been announced called Too Many Tribbles, and this is coming out in July. And uh, here's a little synopsis on that. Captain Kirk and the crew of the Starship Enterprise come face to face with adorably fuzzy tribbles in this exciting and fun-filled Star Trek little golden book. Captain Kirk and the crew of the Starship Enterprise are ready for almost anything except tribbles. When these small furry creatures invade the ship, Captain Kirk and the crew must act quickly before they are buried in fur balls. Star Trek fans of all ages will love this action-packed little golden book featuring Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, and the rest of the crew from the classic TV series in a unique retro art style. (laughs) You know, my daughters, they're not really big into Star Trek, but, you know, they're teenagers now. But when they were younger, I would have been reading these books to them, even if they say, no, daddy, I don't want to hear that one. I'm like, well, no, 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 you just need to give it a shot at least once. <laughs> you know, it's like, I would love to read this to my daughters. Yeah. I feel like I, I haven't picked up any of the gold, little golden books. Um, but I feel like I should pick this one up along with the previous, uh, two that have come out in the star Trek series. My fiance and I don't have kids yet, but Maybe someday. And I I would love to have these in the collection because uh, just the thought of sitting down and reading these with a with a kid, I think, is really cool. And even if that doesn't happen, you know, I think these make really cool little collectibles and I would love to have them. Well, one day I may have grandchildren, so I guess I can read it to them. But honestly, I don't feel like I need to get these to read to my kids or my grandchildren or my great grandchildren or whatever. I just grew up with little golden books and to have Star Trek in that format is just something fun. And I would just like to page through it. And I mean, even the cover of this one just looks like a lot of fun. And it just makes sense that if you're going to take a classic episode of Star Trek for kids, you got to go with the tribbles because that was one thing my kids really loved when they would always say, Hey daddy, put in the tribbles episode or put in the tribble animated episode. Cause my one daughter just loved it when the big tribble showed up on Kirk's chair in the animated series. She just thought that was funny. <laughs> That's a great moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Kids, well, everybody loves tribbles, not just kids. I have to say. So I think, yeah, this is a really good choice for this book. And yeah, you know, I, I could use potential future kids as an excuse to buy these, but the truth is, you know, I'll be paging through them and reading them and probably getting just as delighted, if not more than a kid would <laughs> reading these. So, yeah. And I just want to say to the listeners, I don't expect us to do a feature and devote a whole episode to reading the little golden books, but you know what? You just never know. <laughs> Maybe we'll do like a little bonus episode for patrons where we read it as a bedtime story. That would be fun. I would love that. (laughs) I I think we definitely have to do that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm actually liking that idea the more I think about it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's all we have in the news. And now we want to go to some feedback that we received about episode 253 that we had posted in the Babel Conference on Facebook. And this was our episode where we had Christian Hamburg on the author, one of the authors of the uh, Prometheus books. And we interviewed him about those books. And so we have one comment here and it's from Justin Ozer. Wow. And Justin's coming on the show later. And Justin always posts a comment. So we appreciate that. But he says he's listening now. Great interview. He says that he really enjoys the Prometheus trilogy and he thinks it got stronger and stronger with each novel. He says, I'm not sure if you mentioned this in the interview, but the speech that Federation President Kel Lazar Ziztradas, it's a weird Andorian name, gives towards the end of the third novel is absolutely amazing and one of my favorite scenes in any Trek novel. I think, you know, I always love and Dorian's. And I do remember, I, I'm really liking how this new president was presented in the book. 
Yeah. And Justin, that was, I agree completely. That was a great speech kind of reflecting on how the choices that the Federation made led to the crisis that took place in these novels and what they've learned from that. And I think Star Trek is at its best when it's mirroring contemporary society and the issues we're facing. And this trilogy, I think, did a really excellent job of doing that and really earned its place in you know, Star Trek stories of the of the type that really have a deep meaning and I think carry on that tradition of presenting dilemmas that we face today in a futuristic setting to make us really think about how we need to make the world better and that sort of thing. I'm kind of rambling, but I, I definitely agree this is an underrated trilogy. I think more people need to read it than probably have. Uh, I, I feel like it might get dismissed from people who read other Star Trek novels, but I think it really deserves a good look. And I love these books, I do have to say. Yeah, I love these books too. And when they came out originally in German, uh, I couldn't read them. And I was disappointed by that. And I was just thinking about it today, how wonderful it is that not only am I able to read them now that I've read them in English and actually got to talk to one of the authors. And when these books were originally published, I never expected any of that to happen. So to read Mm -hmm. the books and hear from one of the authors is a great privilege and I really enjoyed it. So, uh, and thank you for everyone else who liked our post about the show not just me, Dan, and Justin, but Patrick, Kenny, Oz, Ralph, Vinny, Adam, and Steven. Thank you for liking the post on the Babel Conference. And we look forward to more uh, comments about uh, future episodes on our post in the Babel Conference. So I say, since we were talking about Justin's comment, we should go right into the feature with him. I agree completely. Justin, come on in. Okay, so now we're into our feature, and we're going to review the third novel in the IKS Gorkin series called Enemy Territory by Keith R.A. DeCandido. And, of course, Dan's going to do this with me, but we can't do it just by ourselves because the last two IKS Gorkin books, we did it with Justin Ozer, and so why not have Justin come back in all his Klingon form? Justin, how are you doing? Kapla. I'm doing great. <laughs> it's great to be here for a third time. Yeah. And uh, was I supposed to read the book or is that later? Yeah. Well, no. Yeah. You're supposed <laughs> to read the book, but that's okay if you didn't, because we'll tell you about the book and then okay. you just react to that. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Just and, pretend, you, you know, maybe I'll, while, while you're describing it, I'll just quickly flip through data style and read it. Oh, I just read it. Okay, good. Perfect. <laughs> I'm all ready. <laughs> wow. So you're an Android and a Klingon. Yeah, that's weird, isn't it? Do Klingons make androids? And what would uh, they be like? I don't know. Maybe they're called Detaz. <laughs> <laughs> Took me a second there. <laughs> oh, man. I thought, oh, boy, that wasn't very funny. No one laughed. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a second. I like, was like, oh, wait, wasn't you have really to put funny, the little apostrophe there. <laughs> that's kind of what made it I funny. love Dan's face. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell we're in a good mood, listeners. <laughs> oh, boy. It's because we read this book. That's why. That's so, sure. It no, is. I sure. Mean, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go into this episode by starting with the... Um, Elleberg hegemony, <laughs> which is this race of beings on this planet. Okay. Um, so let's, um, uh, let's, Ele- the, let's do agreed <laughs> um, pronunciation. How did you think it went? I, th- I thought it was Elleberg hegemony. Yeah. That's h- kind of how I was thinking. Elleberg hegemony. I don't know. I, I don't know. Sorry. I asked my wife, I asked my wife how she would pronounce these and it kept changing when we went through and I can't remember what we came up with as a conclusion. Hmm. <laughs> So, Elebridge. So, anyway, the Elebridge, those are the aliens. I think that's the cra- correct pronunciation. So, uh, we learn about them because they are on their starship, which is called... Oh, the conveyances. Yeah, they call them conveyages, these ships. But I'm still going to call them ships because conveyages, I'll keep forgetting what that is. But anyway, they're they're on their conveyages, <laughs> their conveyage or Con- whatever their cha- Con- conveyance, conveyance, conveyances. conveyance. They're on their conveyance. You know, I sometimes say clag, 
clang instead of clag just saying <laughs> anyway <laughs> that's for you keith so anyway uh they're on the ship and uh then we also have an a klingon ship here where captain work war work uh, yeah i was wondering how to pronounce that i pronounced it work but yeah that's weird because it just sounds like w r o r k work but it's w i r r k well i also thought it sounded like kirk but with a w instead Work yeah. on Kirk. You know, maybe that's kind Clag of isn't the Klingon it. Kirk. Maybe work is the Klingon Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> maybe work is the Klingon Kirk. It's entirely possible. <laughs> I don't know. He is pretty heroic. <laughs> well, anyway, the two ships meet and the alien race goes and shoots at the Klingons first. They did a Vulcan hello. But the Klingons did not accept that very well and they shot back. And uh, destroyed the ship. And now the Klingon ship is heading to this home world to deal with this alien race. So this alien race, the Ella Breg, Ella Brug, Breg, Gag, whatever <laughs> calling them, they are these weird looking six limb kind of slug eyes all around their heads kind of creatures that they don't can even see have heads 360 well yeah, <laughs> yeah they're just this blob body or something yeah i i have to tell you i was having a really hard time visualizing them and i was thinking like oh maybe somebody has put together some fan art well the answer is no i wish because i was like <laughs> okay they have like six legs there's 10 fingers on each leg they have no heads they have 360 degree vision they kind of sense and speak out of something in the center it was just like what <laughs> towards the I, end yeah. there was some description of them that made me think that like okay two of the legs come like out the top of their body and two out the bottom and then two yeah. in the middle which like made me think of them as like really symmetrical or something like that and then everything is kind of centered in the middle like they said their brain is like center mass and all this stuff but it seemed like they could st- almost stand on any of them yeah like they were they were they sounded like all of their legs were identical and like were hensile like they could but but i i was also thinking like is it just like on one side what we call left and right side of the body or is it like this way or oh. some are here i just yeah. don't know i'm not sure i, don't know. I kind of pictured three on, on one two. side three on the other and they can walk on two and then if they get tired they can switch to another two and walk and then they they sit in hammocks which i thought was i, I love that too. <laughs> that they're in hammocks instead of chairs i felt like like really relaxed vibe like yeah we're just going to conduct this meeting in a hammock <laughs> like <laughs> like i could conduct a few meetings in a hammock yeah the first time it's mentioned, one of them gets into a hammock, and I was like, oh, okay, so <laughs> they don't have a bed, they're sleeping in a hammock, and yeah. then, yeah, then it's a meeting, and they all got in their hammocks, and I was like, <laughs> wow, those are the kind of meetings I want to be in. <laughs> it's, it's the hammock planet. <laughs> 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 but yeah, at first, like, it was in a waiting room, and I was like, oh, maybe they just wait in hammocks, but everyone is in a hammock. It's cool. Well, yeah, because they don't have butts to sit on, right? <laughs> I mean, we've established that they're really just a like just a like a piece of rice, you know. What? <laughs> well, I mean, How I'm talking about the shape. <laughs> I'm just picturing like almost wor- like a short worm with yeah. some limbs, you but, know. But and, like this, like out of all the, and there have been some like really far out races and species that have been described in Star Trek novels. This might've been the most far out because it's the one I had the most trouble visualizing. Mm-hmm. I don't know about you guys, if you've had tr- more trouble visualizing another one, but this has been the one where I'm like, what, what is that like? You know? Yeah. Well, and that's what makes it feels alien too. Yeah, it feels yeah. more alien that way. And you feel the way the Klingons do like, what is going on? You mm-hmm. know? Yeah, it was definitely something like, like I said, I was kind of revising my image of them every time, like as as I was reading. I also really like how we learn more about them is kind of through their eyes as they look at the Klingons and see them as this really weird looking species. And, you know, yeah. how like, many what is eyes? that thing growing out of their torsos? Yeah, they have <laughs> some like sort head. of thing out of the top of their heads. And it turns out that their brain is in there. And I mean, there's no protection, but they've got those ridge things, I guess, you know. And can you believe they can only see out of those two holes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, oh. <laughs> well, see, the way you're uh, describing them and their perception of the Klingons is how we were just doing about the Alebreg or Alebreg, <laughs> <Brig>, whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. 
And I, I also liked, I really appreciated how it kind of filtered through into their society versus the Klingon society as well. Like when one of the Klingons says like, you know, I wouldn't do that by turning my back on them or something. And they're like, turning your back? Like, what? what? <laughs> oh, What's right. Because <laughs> you can only see out the front. That makes sense. You know? <laughs> I love that. It was just nice it, little it, touch it was, like that. Yeah. It, it was fantastic because like it made me imagine if we made first contact with a truly alien species, that's what it would be like. We'd be like using all of these things that we're used to in our in our language and they'd be like, well, what, what, what do you mean? <laughs> like we have no concept of that. It's yeah, it's it's pretty great. Yeah, I like the idea of the Elebrae can see all around them. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. that seems logical. It does seem limiting that we can only see one direction. I know. Right? I, like, they, they were putting all these arguments, and I was like, huh, we are pretty limited, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. And, like, and just the fact that the one says, like, I don't even see how a species could possibly exist like this. Like, how could they even <laughs> do the most rudimentary things? And yeah, if that's if that's a sense that you're completely used to, you wouldn't you couldn't even conceive of it being limited that way. Like I thought that was brilliant. Well, let's let's talk about their society because they have lived in with the impression and even through their religion that they're the only species, the only race that exists in the universe. So when the Klingons are discovered in a sense, a lot of people don't believe this is a real story that it's fabricated. Uh, just like some people think in on here on earth that going to the moon was a fabrication and, all, and it was all done in a studio. Like some people just don't believe that. And one of the reasons, you know, that when they find out about the Klingons, their perception of them is, well, they can't be very bright. They can't be very educated. I mean, how could they come in ships? Look, they only have two legs or something and they can only see one direction. <laughs> like they can't be like, all that smart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then at one point they even think that the Klingons must be like servants or slaves to another species that must look like them. Like, wow. Yeah. It's I, really interesting. I, I find that really interesting. And it's, 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 uh, it's something that we as people have been guilty of is, you know, this kind of centrism about, you know, this is what, uh, an evolved species must look like and that kind of thing. And just to see that flipped on its head like that is really cool. And Star Trek's been often guilty of that, right? Like, oh, it must look like a human, but with some different ridges and stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, they could even see a Klingon and then they see Klingons later and they look different. And then they see them again in, on Discovery <laughs> and they look different. <laughs> So you're saying they're having different first contacts with TOS Klingons and then motion picture Klingons and then TNG Klingons and then Discovery Kling Yeah, well, yeah. That's well, not the it's right really order, because but. there's 24 houses and they look different in each yes. house. Right? That must yes, be it. Yeah, it is. I think so. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. <laughs> so what do you think of the separatists that we have here on this planet? Because I, I love the idea that... The government thinks that everybody should be happy because, you know, we're living this great life and we have great medical care and we have all these great things. And it's people are like, uh, no, there's some of us that are poor and don't have good care and uh, don't have jobs. Yeah, it was a very good kind of illustration of stratification in a society because the government is made up solely of people from this one particular social strata and, you know, they just, they determine the, sorry, they determine the destinies of all the strata below them and they don't get a say in the government at all. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting because they have this oligarchy that just has like seven members and they have this first cleric and they're just this small group of people that are making these decisions. And it would make sense that they're just doing things to enrich themselves uh, at the expense of other people. So I thought that was really interesting to see put in a, a different element, but also to see that there were things that they had introduced to try to kind of head off, um, you know, protests or reforms like, oh, maybe we'll have people in this other group, but not these other people in our government or, you know, maybe not just the highest people will get education, but maybe some others will. So but I like that. I actually would like at, at one point it was one chapter from the Elbridge, one from the Klingon perspective. And I would have liked it if there was a bit more of that. And it kept kind of rotating like that. So you can learn more about each perspective and each each different uh, society, really. But I, I like that we got so much from their perspective, especially at the beginning. Yeah, and we did get some perspective from the Klingons, like you're saying. I mean, uh, it, even just the buildings uh, that are on this world or everything is 
a sphere, you know, and even from the, um, the Elebrig is the whole idea that Klingon ships are flat with different yeah. <laughs> shapes and dimensions. And that just shows that these things are Klingons are screwed up, you know, because yeah. Not, not everything's a sphere. Not everything's round. Yeah, all these straight lines and angles. How alien and weird is that? <laughs> like, what? what is that? And I think at a certain point, one of the Klingons is like, do, do all they do is circles and spheres? You know, they get really annoyed by it. Because <laughs> for them, it just seems alien. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of annoyed, we have a character named Kurak, and we've mentioned her in other episodes, and she's the engineer of the Gorkon. And uh, we come to find out that, you know, she's got this really bad attitude about the defense force and that she is all like just doesn't like where she is and what she's doing and all these things. And we find out that she's suffering from alcohol poisoning. And that's has something to do with her depression of being on the ship. So I thought that that was a very interesting take on her. Uh, with the alcohol poisoning, even to the point that when the doctor tells her, if you have just one more drink, you will die. And she's like, I don't care. I'll have a drink. I'm okay with dying. Yeah. And, and like the other interesting thing about it was, I think the doctor Borak says at one point, like, I've never seen this in a Klingon before because <laughs> usually they can take whatever. I mean, so Kirok must be taking it to such an extreme <laughs> that, that it's gotten really bad. I, I thought that was really interesting because this takes place some weeks after the last novel. And it seems like since that mission at Santara that she's been like even more depressed. And I think part of it came from like at the, in the other novel, I think Lokor, who's the security chief had said something that seemed to threaten her that she needed to stay in or that if she didn't do what she was supposed to, that he would make sure that, you know, the nephew wouldn't join who, when he joins, she, she would leave. So she feels like boxed in by these circumstances and she's just gotten so extremely depressed it's really gotten to the point where she doesn't care anymore at least for most of it yeah i really appreciated this kind of examination of her character this time around because like you said in the last novel we got a little bit of it and we see why this is kind of happening but to this point she's kind of just been you know a really angry engineer who doesn't want to be there and is contemptuous of the klingon defense force and in this one, we just get this little bit more of a peek into kind of what makes her tick and even kind of recapping the episode of The Next Generation that she was in. I never really looked at it from her perspective where she's like, I go because I'm interested in this metaphysic shielding technology. I get there and this woman human doctor accuses me of murder and it's just the I had the worst time. Nothing ever goes right. And I was like, oh, that that sucks. Like poor Kirak. You know, I really kind of felt for her this time. Well, and I also like the whole relationship with Leskit and, mm. you know, she's like, why are you even coming around? Why are you even wanting to see me? I mean, he doesn't uh -huh. say that he loves her or anything necessarily, but that's almost like implied. Like it's like he's there to help her. He he wants yeah. to help her in any way he, she, he can and she can't understand why if anybody you want to help, why her? Like she doesn't even feel worthy of being taken care of. Yeah, and, and I think what's really interesting is it's really an examination of mental health in a Klingon and what can be done about that. And Leskett is, you know, I mean, he has this relationship with Kurak, but it seems like even outside of that, he's really concerned, like, this is really eating at you and you need to do something about it. And he's being really supportive, whereas some, another Klingon might just be like, whatever, you know, if if she's not fit for this she'll just die, whatever, <laughs> you know, like that's sometimes the Klingon way, like, well, this is a person who's unfit, but, but he sees that she's suffering and wants to help with that because he still sees potential in what she can do, which I think is really great. And something, I don't know if I've really seen in another novel. I mean, I think that you see things about Klingon mental health with Kern when he's really depressed and DS9, but mm -hmm. it's it's a rare thing. Yeah, and I I also really appreciated the revelation that you know Leskett kind of susses out. Well, you know, you're letting me into your bed every night, and you're getting enjoyment from that. You're not completely lost because you're still making the best of a really bad situation, and that kind of seems to be the little tiny bit of a, an opening in the doorway that she's able to kind of step through and come out the other side a little bit, kind of that realization that, 
no, I don't completely want to kill myself. I don't want to give up on everything. I, I still have some enjoyment I can get out of life and figure this thing out kind of thing. I thought that was a really interesting take on it. And I don't remember what the turning point was, but she does start to appreciate things. Her attitude does start to turn around mm-hmm. when we get to the end of the book. And she has always, yeah. ha- always had a respect for Clagg. Mm-hmm. So she doesn't want to, so there's a group of, and we're going to get into this here in a, in a moment, but you know, there's some Klingons that are looking to overthrow Clagg and have a mutiny on the Gorkon. And she, they naturally think, oh, she'll definitely be on board with us because she's just miserable here and she hates everybody. And that's not the case. She really does respect Clag. It's the Klingon defense force that she has a problem with. Yeah, she's just, at that point, she's just plain miserable. She doesn't care who's in command. It, it, it seems like to me, I know she has a respect for Clag, but at a certain point, it's like, overthrow him, keep him, I don't care because <laughs> she's really depressed. Yeah, I love the scene when she's in, uh, well, sick bay or whatever they call it on the ship, but that this one Klingon member, when they're alone, says, hey, come join us in this mutiny. And she's just like, no, why? Like, I don't care. Like, (laughs) you know, yeah, I'm not happy, but I don't even want to join you guys. Like, none of this. I'm not interested in any of this. And it's almost like I relate to her in the fact that, you know, sometimes you just, you know, like, I I don't like everything that I'm situated. I just need something different. I need a change. It's the Mm -hmm. Klingon version of office politics. She just doesn't want to get involved. Assassinate your superior, (laughs) whatever. I'm I'm going to be in the break room. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mentioned earlier about the mutiny, so I'm going to jump over to that real quick. And uh, there are a bunch of Klingons that have joined the ship. They came from the Kreltek ship uh, from earlier novels. And now that the missions have ended in those two parter uh, books, the first two books that we read, you know, there's this underlying thing going on in the ship where people are like, Hey, we need to overthrow Clag and take over the ship. And so what'd you guys think of that subplot of the mutiny? You know, like, I, I, so there was this thread going on and I was wondering where it was going. And I think it makes sense based on what happened in the previous novel that there might be still be some people who aren't happy with, with Clagg. They're part of this ship that was fighting against his forces. But then I thought about it afterwards and I was like, if the whole thing was removed, does it really affect anything except maybe one of the topics that we talk about a little bit later? But I, I, I just wondered actually whether it was necessary. I I don't know how maybe necessary to this story it was with the exception of providing Kurak with the turning point that comes later in the story. But that's true. to me, it really felt like um, just, just kind of the threads that are kind of weaving through this whole series. I like the fact that the whole two-parter before happened and there's consequences for it, you know, it's not a small thing that Clegg and his crew did. They went up against their general and rallied a bunch of Klingons to fight with them against their own uh, forces. And even though it was sanctioned um, afterwards by Martok, the fact that there's still those lingering feelings and the fallout from that, I think uh, was really good and, and very much welcomed by me because it would not make sense if there was kind of no consequences for that. Yeah. No, it makes sense. It it just felt a little bit like there was a lot of energy that was being put into it that maybe I would have preferred a little bit more about the Elebrej society or their perspective. It was fine. And I mean, it makes sense and it moved things along for a couple of characters. It was just something that I, that I wondered. But yeah, in thinking about it, it's almost like, I mean, we talked about this a little bit with the previous book, like you know, people are talking about, oh, fighting other Klingons and, you know, it's part of their tradition to assassinate their superiors if they're not doing their their job. So it's almost like what happened before was on just like a bigger scale, almost like a ship or a group of ships is looking to assassinate like another group or something like that. It's kind of how I think about it. And now that there are some of those forces on their ship, it's just, yeah, it, it makes sense because that was a pretty intense struggle. But it it just felt like there were like these little things throughout the novel. And I just wondered if maybe probably would have liked to because I like the Yellow Bridge Society so much. I actually wanted to see more of it. Mm-hmm. It's I kind of almost hope it shows up somehow in another novel. I don't think it ever does, but I'd love to see more about these people for sure. Or maybe like even like a reference like it happened in the Time 2 book. Yeah. <laughs> <for> the Centaur. <laughs> 
Well, that's the one thing I was wondering. I was reading the book because the first two books were two parters, and I wondered yeah. if this was going to be the same way. Me so too. I was a little surprised as things were going on. I was like, I think this is wrapping up. So we may not see the Ella Bridge anymore. It doesn't. It doesn't seem like it. Yeah, and 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 that's another thing that was interesting. Like at the beginning, I was like. It's probably a two part, and then I was like, "It's probably one part." Wait, no, it's going to take a while to wrap up. It's probably no. Wait, it's. I mean, I kept going back and forth, thinking whether it was one or two parts, and I didn't want to spoil it for myself. And then toward the end, it was like, "Yeah, it's it's just this one part." <laughs> well, I wonder if the whole subplot of the mutiny is going to lead into the next book, and that's mm. that is kind of the two part of these books uh, coming up. I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, and it's the Ella Bridge has the separatists. And we have a mutiny being formed on the Gorkin. So there's yeah, like a parallel there where, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a bridge crew or society, not everyone's happy and everyone's trying to overthrow the other. Like no one's ever going to be 100% happy with the leadership of a ship or a planet or a country or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, just look at politics today. You know? That's that's true. Although there is like a certain line that you cross over when it gets into like rebellion or mutiny or whatever, right? As opposed to just like we don't like this, and we're going to try and go through this process. But it, I mean, it seems like for the for the Elbridge, like there's there's poverty and there's starvation and there's like all these difficult things that are that are getting them to rebel. For the for the Gorkon, for the mutineers, it was almost just. It's not like they're really suffering physically. It's just that they don't think their captain is honorable and they want to do something about it. So it feels almost like in the case of the Klingon ship, it's more a part of their tradition and their privilege, whereas it was kind of, kind of a bit life and death for the El Prej. Well, and when I think of Klingon ships, I always think they're always trying to overthrow the captain. <laughs> you know, the first officer is always trying to get in command at some point. You know, it just seems to be the Klingon way. I mean, it's not like Voyager where you have the Maquis come on and the Maquis weren't forming a mutiny. I mean, Janeway and Chakotay handled that situation beautifully. Ooh, could you imagine if there was like a, a Klingon version of Voyager <laughs> where like <laughs> this Klingon Maquis group and like this Klingon ship and ah, yeah. That would be awesome, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing with the mutiny that I wanted to touch on a little bit, and and I don't know, it, we're kind of almost already into a bit of spoiler territory. I don't know if we want to be like... I think we're getting there, yeah. 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 Okay, so official spoiler warning for everyone out there. Uh, getting into the mutiny, what I found as it went further, I found myself really looking askance at Locor and his whole role mm. on the ship <laughs> and what he's up to. And then, of course, by the end, I'm like, dude, what is with this guy? Um, so, you know, there was that aspect that I think is going to continue on with his character in the next book as well that kind of revealed a bit about what he's all about. And, you know, up to this point, I was like, oh, he's a very good security officer. He's very vigilant and he's got, you know, um, Klingon intelligence um, ties, I guess, somehow. And he knows all these secrets. But by the end of this book, I am scared to death of this guy. Like, what do you guys no, think I, of I him? I have to ask because I, because I was, I was trying to remember as I went through it. Do, do you mean his thread of like the, the mind sifter thing yeah there was that else. and there was the i uh, love that part the basic <laughs> torture of the other officer <laughs> like all the oh, stuff yeah, that yeah. was kind of going on there that, i mean he ugh. he is just like yeah pretty cold-blooded about so many things <laughs> well i think that's what i like about the mutiny storyline is and this isn't a big part of the book but mm -hmm. you know, about the mutiny but the how, what that does for Locor and for Trant. Like, I really love these yeah. two characters now. Before, you know, I liked them before, but now I've really grown to love these two characters. And we just talked about Locor, but the thing I like about Trant is he's part of the Imperial Intelligence. And so as he reports to Wool, and then he has to come out with his secret of, hey, I'm actually an II agent. <laughs> it's like, you know, from Clag to Wool, it's like, what you wait no i'm in command and trans like no <laughs> i'm in command and just like the the play back and forth of like who's in charge was mm -hmm, really yeah. great to me that was probably some of my favorite moments of the book yeah there's definitely mm. some surprises that yeah. come out of that i wasn't expecting him to try and assert command over yeah. the Gorkon. i'm glad he didn't succeed and then when they're on the planet and he's just offed <laughs> i did not see that coming at all that was a huge surprise 
Yeah, I didn't see that coming. And then when it happens, Will's like, well, I guess he's going to bleed to death. Let's keep going. Because <laughs> <laughs> they have amazing. no love for this guy. <laughs> yeah. She was like, well, you know, I could do the, the death scream, but it would attract some attention. And um, yeah, he's just going to bleed to death. Let's keep going. <laughs> I was like, wow. I think he's going to the other place anyway. So <laughs> he's like, eh, you know, and if he doesn't quite make it there, eh. <laughs> like, I mean, it, it, so that that part has been really interesting about these novels, because I don't think I've seen anywhere else where they mention imperial intelligence um so seeing it in the last book and then just uh just deep space nine the series but yeah. it mentions imperial intelligence and but you don't see an actual agent do you yeah they capture three uh imperial intelligence agents in the third season episode visionary they uh plant a, oh, okay. a device outside the romulans quarters that's the episode that o'brien's jumping through time Oh, that one. I think I tend to just focus on O'Brien, but yep. Okay. So yeah. All right. So we've seen it before, but I don't think I've really read about it. And just to see so much of the interaction and this friction where everybody just kind of (laughs) hates Imperial intelligence. And, and when this, they find out this guy, (laughs) this guy is Imperial intelligence. I think it's someone like Gajoth who like takes his his diktog and he's like, can I kill him now? (laughs) Like there's just (laughs) like this incredible friction. And it actually reminded me a little bit of this is a little different, but like face of the enemy where there's this, this kind of struggle between like the tall Shiar who are really hated and like the regular crew. So there's a struggle with this intel, these intelligence agents, but they're kind of critical for getting them to these prisoners and freeing them and, and all of that. But it's kind of like really grudging. And I did think it, it was interesting that they, you know, one of them survived the one that was there, Bethledge, I think it is. So that's, I wondered if that might continue or they might have something more with her maybe because i think toward the end of the book it was just like uh she wants to to speak to you captain i think toke was saying that he's like not going to talk to her until we get to chrono she'll just have to stew on it so yeah. like this this friction is really interesting yeah and i kept expecting some sort of resolution with that and i, th- I thought that was an interesting bit that clegg's just like nah <laughs> let her stew i'm not going to talk to her and i'm like I'm like you, like they've got to pick that up in the next one, I, I would imagine, because like, what's I, that I about? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And going back to Trant, when he died, I don't know if you were like me, but I was like, is he really dead? Mm-hmm. Is, is this no, really I knew, happened? I, 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 I knew he was, well, maybe I had like a little seed of doubt, like is something come back, but I, I thought they were doing it in such a way that he was just gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause, cause I think over the like, course Ooh. of those two pages, I was like, Okay, he dead. <laughs> yeah, but, that's yeah. But like it's at first, pages, I was like, I was "Oh, like, he's been shot," but the, he's too yeah. he's too important, right? They're gonna keep him on for. Oh no, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's how I was, and then I was disappointed. I was like, "Man, I was really liking this guy. Now he's gone." <laughs> I actually didn't like him. <laughs> I mean, not. I mean, like he's he's a great character, but I really like had the revulsion toward him. That I think that that Will did. I don't know why. <laughs> In some ways, it was very, like, kind of almost stereotypically literary that he got killed off the way he did, because there's kind of a a thing in literary works that if a character shows too much hubris, that that they have to pay a price of some kind. And he had, like, when he stood up to Clagg and is like, I'm taking command, I was like, wow, that is a ton of hubris. And he was very, he was very arrogant about it, too, Mm -hmm. you know, at, at various, at various points. Yeah, so I I thought like he had it coming for him, but then this other in, agent Betledge, like she seems maybe a little more like humble about it, so she survived. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see where that goes. Mm-hmm. So then we have the character of Wool, and we've mentioned her a few times here, and she's a leader and a warrior, and she's dealing with all these challenges with the changes in her squad and being captured and experimented on by the Ella Bridge. And, uh, you know, the the crew of the ship that we talked, the Klingon crew that we talked about earlier, when their ship was eventually destroyed and some of the crew was captured, they're on the planet being experimented on and Wu and her troops are going in and trying to save them. And then all of a sudden she gets captured and she's being experimented on. And so uh, what do you think of her character in this book? We've talked about her in the other books, but I thought uh, we got some really good moments with her in this one. Definitely. Yeah, consistently she's been one of my favorite characters in all of these books. And this book is definitely no exception. Uh, I love her uh, just the way she's able to overcome these obstacles and, you know, fighting 
naked and shorn. <laughs> she's been turned into a discovery Klingon, apparently. And she's that's exactly her. what I thought. That's so. what I was thinking. <laughs> that's totally how I pictured her. I started kind of almost seeing Laurel in my head. I'm like, okay, no, wait, wait. Yeah. Go back to the image I had of Wool and, and take away the hair. But yeah, she's just an incredible character. And I love even the lessons she learns in this novel from her experience with Trent, where she was so critical of him for not being up front with her and his fellow warriors that that kind of tells her, OK, I need to be up front and I need to tell my, you know, my big dark secret to the warriors I fight with. I just that whole story from beginning to end. I just anytime she was on the page, I was loving it. Yeah, because she's talking about, you know, if you're going to be uh, warriors and you're fighting together, if you're a team, you have to be honest with each other. And Trent, you've been keeping a secret. How dare you? Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be yeah. honest when we're a group of warriors and we're an army together. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. I've been doing the same thing. Oh, crap. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. And what was really great about that was like, and it's been over the course of these three books. So it's been, you know, very much earned and it's not just coming out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. because you know at the beginning you know that she the first book i think you know she has this secret that she was part of this noble house it was she was in disgrace and and then becomes like a, a common soldier and then in the first book they made her a leader and she was like kind of wondering if she could do it but she really like through through like her feats in battle but also in really i think she's really like deft at klingon like social customs or something because like she she really knew how to how to get them to work together and for them to respect her and then some of the people in the squad die and there are new ones and she's like working with that and in this book you know she finds a way to get some blood wine and have them tell all their stories and whatnot and and it cements them even further and then like i mean she does this thing this thing that's probably going to be the subject of some songs right where she, where she just like breaks out of this this terrible situation and you know with just like one weapon and is just like running around and <laughs> like doing her thing right so and then it it gets to the point where she tells this this story to her squad like i have to just let you know that you know as part of this noble house and all that and there's like this long silence and they're like no that, that couldn't be you're you know too great of a warrior for that, you know, and, and a lot of them are just like, it doesn't matter, you know, and, and just to see that it just like, it felt so good because she has all this respect and this love from her squad and she's just doing an amazing job. I mean, like while I was reading this, I was like, what's the next step for her? I mean, she should be one of the, the people that leads a company or they call it a cost of we, right. She should just like keep moving up and she would even like be amazing as, I don't know, even further as a, first officer or captain or whatever like it's just like really impressive how this character we'd never heard of before has been built up to the point in these three books that she just hasn't such an incredible journey already and i really want to see what happens next yeah and that's the thing i i think especially in book two i was really curious to see what was going to happen with her next not just the fact that she killed her son but mm. you know where she is in her career as a Klingon warrior. I mean, she, yeah. she seems like she, like you said, she should be advancing into something more prominent, whether it's a first officer or a captain or something. And I'm just wondering if that's what we're building towards, maybe even into the next book, where what are we going to see more from Wool? And, and maybe if it doesn't even happen in the next book, maybe Keith DeCandido had some ideas for this character later on that he never got to. I don't know if, if she's even appeared in other books outside of these. I'd have to I don't want to spoil that. what happens in the fourth book, so I don't want to research it yet. <laughs> I know. I, I've been really wanting to look her up on Memory Beta, and I've really had to resist I've, the temptation. I've had to resist, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to read the fourth one, you know, in about a month, so we'll check on it after that. But yeah, I wondered as well, like, maybe he picked it up in some other books or somebody else did, because just a fantastic character. I mean, like, it's. I think it's to the point that she's actually one of my favorite Klingon characters, whether we see them on screen or in the novels, which is really something. Yeah, I think that's definitely the case for me. Um, just one minor thing, too, I wanted to mention was, I can't remember exactly who said it, but basically says to her, no, that, that woman you're talking about, she died. She died with her house. You yes. were, you were yeah. reborn. You, you are a new person now. I thought that was just so touching. And 
Like if Klingons had tear ducts, she would have cried. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It, it was really wonderful. And, and there's some truth to that. Like she's living a different life now. She's really a different person and has remolded herself, but not like faking it, but she's authentically like this person that's this fierce warrior and this protector of her squad and all of that. It's, yeah, it's, it's mm-hmm. really something. And I think it's good that we're given hints of a backstory to her over time, which just makes her even more and more interesting. So speaking of backstories, uh, Rodek is on the ship, and his backstory is he's the brother of Worf, and of course he was Kern until he was reinvented into Rodek. And when we saw him in the second book, we saw that he started to remember that he was Worf's brother, have some memories of Kern, what Kern had memories of of Worf, but he doesn't know he's he was Kern. He's just having these kind of flashbacks, these little memories. And we're seeing this from uh, some medical tests. And so I really thought by the time we got to this book that we'd really start to see him come into his realization of who he really is. And we didn't quite get that except for one quick scene near the end of the book. And again, spoilers, but as the mutiny is taking place on the ship, Kodak is shot at basically in the face. And he has one fleeting thought, and that was, and I should have wrote it down, what he said. Yeah, I think he said something like, this is all Worf's fault. Yeah, like, this is your fault, Worf. I think that's what he says. Right before he falls into a coma, his last thought was, you did this to me, Worf. (laughs) You did this to me, Worf, yes. You know... Worf has done it to all of us in these books. Worf, there's a connection. Everybody, you know, Star Trek is the story of Worf. That's Dan's theory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and there's six mentions of Worf in here, so you know, six degrees of Worf. Anybody could be connected. Yes, Worf. we counted before we start recording. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, like, I, I, I kind of knew it was coming, but I kind of gasped when I saw it. I was like, he knows, but he's in a coma. So, you know, it's like a soap opera, like, next week. <laughs> That's exactly what I was so. thinking. I was like, it's... wait, they killed Trant. No, no, not Rodek. And then it's I like, thought they oh. were going to kill him, too. <laughs> I know. I was like, oh, my gosh, is he dead? But he's in sick bay. He's being tended to. He's in a coma. Yeah, this whole thing with Rodek. First of all, I think the best thing about having this character in the novel is that I get to picture Tony Todd playing him, who's mm-hmm. just <laughs> yep. the best, you know. Um, but yeah, this this has been slowly building from novel to novel, so much so that I thought, you know, oh, the next novel is going to be all about that. And then we get to this novel and it's just still just little drips and drabs. And then that big moment, like you mentioned at the end. So Um, I love that it's not just, you know, Keith DeCandido is playing the long game here and we get these threads woven through all these stories and it's not just, you know, dumped on you all at once. It's, it's a really nice, slow, methodical way to tell a story and I'm loving it. It's great. I mean, it really makes good use of this being a series, right? Because there are these little things that have been threads since the first book, but this third book is still its own story. I just love that kind of storytelling where there are little threads that get passed through, but maybe it's a different focus or a different story. And that's it's just been done so well. And I do wonder, like I was thinking ahead to the next book, like if there is that revelation, like what does that mean? What would happen? Like, uh, you know, because this is probably something that the other Klingons on the ship would have a real problem with, right? Because he wasn't able to, I guess, do what he wanted to for the ritual suicide or whatever, but was transformed into this different person. Doesn't maybe sound honorable to them, right? What would that mean? (laughs) Yeah. And having not read the fourth book, like you guys, it just dawned on me. If he comes to the realization that he's Worf's brother and others especially Clagg knew about this and had been lying to him. He could be angry and help lead the mutiny and get, Mm. and really there starts to become a war on the ship. Ooh, interesting. Interesting. I have a different theory for what happens in the fourth book, but that that's an interesting thought. It just occurred to me when we were talking about it. Because I like, I actually was thinking, you know, the fourth book is called A Burning House. And at the end of it, they're going to, at the third book, they're going to Kronos. So I'm thinking there's some crisis there on Kronos they have to deal with. But I could be wrong. Well, and Worf is on Kronos, right? <laughs> so <laughs> <have> Worf. <laughs> I, I, I do honestly believe we're going to have a lot of Worf, probably. Yeah. I don't I, know. I could, think Worf, that's my guess too, is he'll make a, a return in the in the fourth book here, for sure. 
Well, and if Rodek's going to remember he was Kern, what a perfect opportunity when they go back to Cronus. He remembers. That's probably why he's in sickbay, because he'll wake up from the coma and is like, oh my gosh, I remember everything. Where's my brother? Oh, there he is. He's Great. right there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's interesting to me is reading this book is is the cover, and we we pretty much sussed out that the Klingon on the cover is Leskit. And he doesn't like he plays a role in this book and he's a presence throughout it and does his typical Leskit things. He pilots the ship. And we also find out he's been taking care of Kurak. She's been getting totally wasted drunk every night. And he's basically been force feeding her uh, sober up pills, I guess, and (laughs) shoving her off to work in the morning every morning. Um, but it's interesting that they chose him to be the cover with this stylized Batleth. I kept expecting him to be in some sort of big Batleth fight, but it never really happens. You know, um, I, I, I wonder because his face is obscured a little bit and maybe he does look like Leskett, but isn't Lokor also an older Klingon? Could this be him? It could be. I, the, the forehead ridges and eyes just match Leskett exactly though like i'm pretty sure they used that as a model i looked at Leskett's pictures i i think it is it looks a lot like him yeah now that i look at it more closely i guess you're right but i mean what does that mean does that mean is that foreshadowing some larger role in the next one i don't know i don't know, I don't know. Although the next one came three years later so i don't know if he'd i don't think he'd written <laughs> that one yet yeah, I'd be curious to talk to Keith and see what the process was. Maybe there was just a bunch of art done for Gorkon and they picked that one because it was the coolest looking. Yeah, or... let's 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 ask him on Twitter because I'm really curious now. <laughs> like, yeah. is this less good? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, you got the cover artist sitting there. They probably was shown, OK, these are the Klingons that were on the different series or in this book and. It could just been simply, ooh, I like this Klingon. <laughs> I'm going to use this It could very well be, cover. yeah. I, I kind of wish, though, it would be like Wool, because I want to see what she looks like. Yeah. I would yeah, have loved to have seen really, Wool. Maybe that is Wool. Maybe Wool looks <laughs> like Leskit. <laughs> Not in this novel, at least. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely a lot less hair than that. Uh, <laughs> at least at the end, for sure. Yes, very Laurel looking now, right? <laughs> Laurel season one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This is so confusing. Who has hair and who doesn't anymore? I don't know. I'm confused. <laughs> I know on the other side of the page, Justin, we were talking about uh, you were kind of hoping that Leskett and Gajoth would team up at some point in this novel. Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I don't know why I thought of it, but I like that Gajoth is kind of like a writer. He likes to write poetry or music or whatever. And for some reason, I just like Leskett's personality and I want him to be in a Klingon poetry slam with Gajoth. Why not? I would totally <laughs> read that. I think even if that were just like a short story. nothing to do with the novel. <laughs> yeah. <that laughs> a would short be amazing. story about their poetry slam? Yeah. <laughs> that ends in a Batleth fight, maybe? Yeah. Okay. Everybody's, a, everybody's a critic, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm making a note to send this idea to CBS for short tracks. <laughs> Perfect. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. I don't know who in Discovery you would have do that, but these short tracks should be about anything, anytime, right? Thank maybe you. Maybe we'll have a Gorkon short track. That Very unlikely, awesome. but I can dream. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, only we would enjoy it, but we would enjoy the heck out of it. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, we oh, would. Yes. There needs to be a cameo in there with Keith DeCandido as a Klingon. Yes. Oh, that would be awesome. I've seen him pop up a few times in other books by other novels uh, as a Klingon named Crad, K R A D for Keith R A DeCandido, which yes. is Oh, really? I remember brilliant. that. Yeah. Yes. What, do you remember which novels or you've seen I, that? In? Oh, I, I don't. Can't remember. It's been a while. It's probably but on yeah. Memory Beta if you looked up Crad like as as a proper name. But I know I have seen it for sure. I I I have too. I just don't remember where. It's been a long time, but I remember seeing that. Yeah, it doesn't come up on memory beta. Oh, shoot. Unless you're looking for a Craddock drum, <laughs> which is a Klingon drum. But anyway. No, I know it's in it's somewhere. I, no, it you. sounds a little familiar, but yeah. Oh, I, I would I would pay a lot just to see a bunch of Star Trek authors in makeup as Klingons. It's like <laughs> some kind of writing contest. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, that's what we're going to try to get out of them at shore leave this year. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. <laughs> so Perfect. what are your final thoughts, Justin, on the book Enemy Territory? 
Well, I mean, again, I think this is a novel where there was just so much going on. I think, you know, we usually for these things, we put four, five, six topics, but I feel like there's a lot more we could have talked about because like, first of all, there was the Elabrej hegemony and a couple of things about that. So, I mean, it's different than what we saw in the, in the previous two novels where you had a species that, you know, didn't have warp, was more primitive, but were really great fighters and things were, you know more even because of these subspace eddies. In this case, you have this species that's going out into space and colonize their different worlds and their systems. So it's like a different perspective. And it was just really great. I mean, again, like we said, to see this truly alien species, to see some of their dynamics, see things from their perspective, how their government worked, all that stuff. It was, that was really great. And then, like, you know, as we talked about the characters, like, Wool and Rodek and Kurak and you know we didn't we talked a little bit about Leskid and Lokor but not much and we could have talked about them or Clag. I mean I feel like there's so much going on but it's not like it's being shortchanged. It's just these are really rich novels and I've just really you know loved each of them and they all have their own like distinctive feel and I'm really looking forward to the fourth one but also sad that that's the last one that it, it didn't continue after after that book in 2008. So. I mean, I just loved it. I mean, it, it, I think the only thing that I was just questioning a little bit was the mutiny and maybe how much, you know, page space was was used on it. But it wasn't like a big deal. And I think you've convinced me it was essential and it'll play out later. But it was just, I loved it. I really have enjoyed these so much and I'm glad that we've we've read them. So what rating would you give it? Oh, yes. I would give it five Elabrege hammocks. <laughs> <laughs> very nice they sound so comfortable i want five like ringing my office around my desk so at different times of the day i can be in a different comfortable hammock and do my work from a hammock why not yeah. i mean they must like if they don't sit down do they like work standing up or do they work from a hammock and they have like special workstations i want to know and i want to know what they look like so if anyone out there can draw them or has seen an image, please let us know because I couldn't find anything. <laughs> yeah, when we have this episode in the Babel Conference, post your images in the Babel Conference, your artwork. That would be great. I'd love <laughs> to see everybody post something in there. So yeah, the hammocks, that's great. You know, the next time we do, when we do the Burning House, maybe we'll podcast from hammocks. That would be a lot of fun and relaxing too at the same time. So Dan, what do you think? Yeah, this was a really excellent novel. I find myself whenever we get to one of these Gorkon novels now, and, and again, like Justin, I'm really sad that there's only one left. I find myself really looking forward to kind of settling down with these characters and, and reading about them much more so than I, I would have anticipated starting this out. I was kind of skeptical about an all Klingon series, you know, a, a series that doesn't have humans in it or the federation i figured might be a little hard to relate to a hard to kind of find an entry point to you know empathize with the characters in but i find myself really getting into these stories and like uh like you guys wool has turned into one of my all-time favorite novel characters period i would say she's just an incredible character and this whole crew is just a lot of fun to read about and one other thing that came up that we didn't talk about, it's it's fairly minor in here, but one thing that's brought up briefly is the Klingon entertainment show, the Battle Cruiser Vengeance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I that's love, you know, fantastic. bringing that forward from the final reflection and the kind of meta humor that the author Im imbues that with, like the alien races with the kind of fakish looking <laughs> makeup that don't really look how they really it's look in great. real life and <laughs> stuff like that. I just, you know, the kind of nod and wink at the audience reading that. I just, I love stuff like that. So there's so much to love in this novel. And honestly, I couldn't find anything in it that I didn't appreciate or enjoy. I think every minute I spent reading this book, I really loved. So I have to give it uh, five out of five Elabrege conveyances that, you know, have really powerful weapons, but unfortunately get blowed up pretty easily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like they have these powerful, we, for, we didn't even talk about that. They have these super powerful weapons, but apparently like no shields and no defenses. If it hits, there, there the ship goes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like I, and I thought that was a fascinating idea too, because how often do you see in Star Trek really powerful weapons and like no defenses? 
I don't know if we do because it seems weird. Yeah, you're right. We didn't even touch on that. There's so many things I feel like, you know, we could just keep talking and things are going to keep coming up like that. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'm with you guys on this. You know, I was thinking how I really enjoyed the first two books, but now that I got to this third book, I like this even more. I mean, so far, this is probably my favorite of the three. And I, I don't really know why. Maybe it's because I'm getting to know these characters more. So I'm more invested into the characters. That helps a lot. I like the idea that the Klingons aren't there to conquer this world, but the Elebrez think they are. And so they think they're a threat when, you know, Klingons <laughs> typically are, but in this case, no, they weren't. But, you know, they, and I, and I thought about how Earth would respond if an alien race were to come and, and the whole, the way the Elebrez are and how the different, uh, the government works and how that relates to the church and the different philosophies of life and where we stand in the universe and what does this mean? It's like, you could even go even further into that, into this book, which I mean, it doesn't, but I mean, he, you know, Keith could have gone even further with that, which would have been even more interesting, uh, but there's just so much going on. But I would say uh, how I feel about this book, I would give this five out of six Ella Bredge limbs like oh one, no an ella bridge he lost an arm so it's five out of six wow <laughs> okay oh oh and th- that reminds me like for for the klingons they're like they wave their arms so much and they can't like look at them it's like look away look away and then for the ella bridge they're like their hands never move <laughs> <laughs> it was just su- such a so great and i did find myself bruce like thinking like okay if we were the ella bridge and this other alien race that was totally different came of course we'd i think we'd find them threatening you know if they if they came and destroyed our ship or whatever so yeah well and we again we didn't get into this but you know the the government there is looking at this as an opportunity opportunity to turn people against the separatists where the separatists actually use the klingons to go against the government i mean it's just yeah it's just mm-hmm. brilliant it, it really is i mean i found myself also in this third one like really not knowing where it's going or what to expect. Whereas to a certain extent in the first two, there was some things I could predict and like, oh, I think it's going to go here. But this one, I was just like along for the ride and I just really didn't know. I think the the main thing I'm coming out of these books with is as much as I love Star Trek, I always want that Star Trek feel. And this isn't about Starfleet and the Federation and the Prime Directive and all those things that we love about Star Trek. Mm-hmm. But yet I still really love these stories. So yeah. it doesn't always it's, have to be about that. Well, but, but I think it and it still has some Star Trek messages in that it's very relevant to us and the human condition and our own societies. Absolutely. And he's doing that basically without any real ties to, to Starfleet or the Federation. I mean, I think like reading these books convinces me that if CBS went ahead with like a Klingon focused series, that it could work that it could be really great. Like you don't actually have to like have it centering on Starfleet characters, which I, I didn't quite expect beforehand. I was like, if they had something and it was like done this well, absolutely. And I would still think of it as Star Trek because we can still kind of glean the same messages because of how it's done. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. I mean, even if it was a series not even about Klingons or the Federation, I mean, yeah, it would could work. have a Romulan series or whatever. I mean, from right. another perspective, it would just be fascinating. That would that would just be so groundbreaking because we've never had that, you know? Yeah, maybe a series about Khan. Ooh, wait, I think they're talking about that. Mm. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, Justin, if people want to find you online, where can they find you? Well, you can find me elsewhere on the network on Earl Grey. That's our dedicated Star Trek The Next Generation podcast. We have a great time talking about TNG every week, and I co-host that with Amy Nelson and Richard Marquez. You can find me on Twitter. I'm at TrekFan4747, where I tweet about nothing but Star Trek, and I'm currently tweeting out my Season 7 rewatch of The Next Generation. You can find me hanging around the Babel Conference on Facebook, and as I like to mention here, I'm part of some... Uh, Facebook Star Trek books and comics groups uh, where I like to post reviews about what I'm reading each week, not just what we talk about here on Literary Treks. Uh, So that's literally Star Trek, the Star Trek books discussion group, and the Star Trek books community group. So you can find me any of those many places. All right. Well, now that we know where to find you, we're going to talk books with you. 
Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Which we already do anyway. So. Absolutely. I, I, I love it, guys. It's it's just so wonderful being able to talk about these things because oftentimes with the novels, I read it and I post like a little review, but I don't have anybody to talk with about it. So it's great to talk with you guys about it. Oh, well, we're happy to have you. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Well, until next time, we have to do the fourth book, right? That's right. Not this far. <laughs> we'll see you next month then. <laughs> <laughs> See you then. So, Bruce, I have to ask you, did you notice how many times in this novel Clagg threw his head back and laughed uproariously? Because it happened at least like five or six times. I didn't really capture how many times it happened. But now that you say it, yeah, I do remember it happening a few times. He uh, it could be exaggerating He's got a good a sense of humor. Well, yeah. He does. But... <laughs> it's kind of funny because... <laughs> Exactly. It's one of the few things I remember him doing in uh, the episode he's in, A Matter of Honor. So Keith very much picked up on that and just has him do that all the time, which I think is an interesting character trait for him. You know, the episode A Matter of Honor, I just watched. I mean, I've seen it before, but I just watched it again last night. And uh, it's really funny because... Just to, you know, I've already was picturing those actors as these characters when I read the books, but anything that, the one thing that really stood out to me from that season two episode is the makeup of the Klingons. And I, it didn't look that good to me, you know, and actually <laughs> it was kind of ruining my impression of the characters as I visualize them in the books. I'm like, Ooh, I don't want to remember them with the makeup. I mean, at the time when I saw, it, I thought the makeup was great, but compared to how elaborate the makeup is now, not just on discovery, but in later versions of star Trek, it's so much better. Yeah. I always, cause, cause Clegg has kind of that big, like huge mound on the top of his head or something. Yeah. There's one just... point it looks like it's just sit, laying there. Like it's not really connected <laughs> to his head. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. I almost, I, I've been wanting to go back and watch that, but maybe I don't now. I don't want it to really like color my impression, I guess. Well, just watching Riker eat is all worth it right there. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Well, it's fun talking about Clag's head and Riker eating today, but it's not the only thing we've been discussing here on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM. Literary Treks. I just want to sing. After every time I hear the title of this book, I want to sing, A Time for War, A Time for Peace. <laughs> funny, funny story. When when this was being pitched at the sales con in the sales meeting uh, at Simon and Schuster, somebody on the sales force was was worried that we that they'd have to get permission to use the titles. Cause, cause it's a song by the birds, and 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 John Order over the editor had to gently point out that it was actually from the Bible, and therefore kind of <laughs> melodic tricks. You know, I suppose as being an actor, you know, I just was really kind of feeling into Clive's character, okay. and and trying to express the emotion of what I felt like he was going through on the Sarangi. Mm -hmm. So then it became much more of a personal individual character it was how i experienced doing it the 602 club but i look at this film as being almost three maybe four different films because when we're in krypton krypton it's very sci-fi oh, uh, excuse me krypton you, yeah you mean we, we krypton. On krypton i'm yeah. sorry marla <laughs> krypton <laughs> so when we're in krypton <laughs> krypton uh, it's very much a science fiction movie. Next thing, all of a sudden, we have Kal-El come to Earth, and now it feels very Norman Rockwell. I mean, it's almost like, I mean, totally different from what we just saw on Krypton or Krypton. To the journey! Brace for impact. Brace for impact, <laughs> yes. Okay, if, uh, I, I, I'm going to make a commitment to myself right now. If I am ever perishing in a plane crash, I am going to say brace for impact right before I die. To everyone on the plane. I will Brace somehow for hear it across the miles. It'll be very dramatic, you know, with some dramatic theme music playing, hopefully, just like we have in Voyager here this episode. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. And you'll find us wherever you get your podcasts.
If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they're published. And we'd really appreciate it if you leave us a star rating and written review. If you're not an Apple user, though, we've got you covered as well. You can find all of the Trek FM's shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, YouTube, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link there as well. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more. Available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. So again, you can find all the details at patreon.com slash Trek FM. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place, of course, to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. And we'll have a topic posting for this episode that you can leave comments on and we will read them on the air. If you'd like to send us an email, you can also use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Literary Treks, and that'll come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter, we're at trek.fm, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. Find us on our Goodreads group where we have bookshelves with all of our previously covered books as well as the currently reading section so you know what is coming up for future shows, plus great conversations happening about the books and comics. Just search for Literary Treks on Goodreads and click Join Group. And we'd like to thank Norman C. Lau, Ken Tripp, Greg Rosier, Brandon Shane Mutala, Justin Ozer, and Jeffrey Harlan for their support of the Trek FM Network and being associate producers for Literary Treks as well. Now, Dan, I see you laying there in your hammock, but when you're not laying there, where can people find you? (laughs) Well, you can find me on Twitter at Kurtrats, and I can luckily do that from my hammock. That's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. You can also find me on YouTube, where I've got a channel talking mostly about Star Trek. And with Discovery coming up soon, I'll be talking mostly about that. That's at youtube.com slash Productions. And I have a website where I review Star Trek novels, both old and new. And that's been going for just about eight years now. That's just at treklet.com. Now, Bruce, when you're not throwing your head back and laughing uproariously, where can we find you? Ha 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 ha. You can find me on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex, and you can find me here on the network doing Live from the Edge, our live podcast about Star Trek Discovery. We will do that on Friday nights after a premiere of Star Trek Discovery, which is on Thursdays. So check us out on YouTube. It's me and Brandy Jacola, and uh, we have a great time doing that show. I also do the Star Wars Report which is about Star Wars, so that podcast is out there. And you can always find me in the Babel Conference. And if you want, and I've never mentioned this before, you can send me an email at bruce.gibson at trek.fm. Oh, very cool. Mm. And thanks, everyone, for listening. And until next time, live long and read on. (laughs) You call that light reading? To each his own, number one.